Okay, great. Thanks so much. Welcome everybody. We're so happy you could join us today. Much anticipated topic, Android 11, here we go. Um, I just wanted to kick this off first to welcome you and to give you a heads up that next week registration will open for Zebra DevCon. Uh, we're going back to our roots, making sure we are working with all of our developers, providing them the best technical information possible. And so we're kicking off a full-fledged event on Zebra TV called Zebra DevCon 2021, Connect, Learn, Build. Um, with that, we're doing it in each applicable region. So we're starting off with APAC on November 3rd, EMEA November 4th, and NALA on November 5th. The time will be approximately from 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. in that applicable time zone. Um, so registration opens next week. We'll have more information on the developer portal as well as some invitations and information on our DevBuzz newsletter. A couple of housekeeping rules for today. Just as a quick reminder, all of our questions can go in the question box. We'll answer those at the end of this webinar, and Darren will be here on deck to do that. Um, and if you have any other questions or concerns after the webinar and you feel like you missed asking something, please note that you can always email us at developer at zebra.com. I'll make sure it gets to Darren or any of our appropriate team members. Um, in addition to that, we're going to have um, a few more dev talks this year, so watch for those invitations. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Darren for our much anticipated uh, updates on Android 11. Thanks, Stacey. Can you hear me okay? Yep, all good. Excellent. And we can yeah, see you, which is very nice. Thank you. Oh, I, I can't <laughs> see myself, so hopefully uh, I'm, I'm framing Wait, it. hello. So, uh, yeah, and I was also going to say, uh, uniquely, uh, we can, if you have any additional questions or, or concerns after this, then I'll be doing a very similar presentation at DevCon, uh, but I'll be going more into Android 12, I think, in my talk at DevCon, because I don't want to be talking about the same thing uh, twice. But the scope of what I'll be talking about today is Android 11, uh, what's new for Zebra developers? I've been giving this talk ever since Android Marshmallow, I think, maybe Nougat, uh, and quite coincidentally or deliberately, however you choose to believe it, uh, this talk has coincided very closely with our release of Android 11 publicly. So we have a number of new devices. I'm holding in my hand a TC52AX available, uh, which is running Android 11 from the factory out of the box. And upgrades are also, I don't know why I'm bothering showing these because you can't really see, it's, it's Android 11 running on a TC52X, also available for download right now from the uh, Zebra developer portal or through uh, lifeguard updates through your EMM. However you get your Zebra updates, they are available. Uh, I'm gonna be going over the changes which Google have made to Android that are relevant and important to know for Zebra developers. So you probably know a lot of this stuff already, uh, and we do get a lot of questions as developers start to target API level 30, Android 11 in their build. So I'll try and also answer some of those frequent questions as we go along here. Um, this slide, I up, I've been updating it for a little while now, as you can tell. Uh, the whole point of this slide, what I'm trying to show is Although every version of Android will have new features, new great new functionality, as well as new restrictions in one way or another, they do tend to fall along similar lines. And this Android 11 is no exception, and it looks like Android 12 is not going to be any exception, but uh, yeah, spoiler alerts on that. Um, there'll always be some kind of restrictions about running in the background. There'll always be some changes around notifications. Uh, there will be a couple of other things which are worth talking about, and then any sort of new enterprise Android features which Google have added. Uh, Android 11 is it's not really a, a fundamental change, in my opinion. I mean, obviously, Google will say, yes, every version of Android is a fundamental change in, in the operating system. Um, but in all honesty, as a developer, you just need to be aware of a, a couple of things which I'm going to cover, and then you will be ready and set for, for you know, a Zebra deployment running Android 11. So uh, what I normally do is take the features which Google consider as uh, headline worthy and sort of embolden those which are enterprise skew. 
and this is it's worth noting here that there is a lot of documentation on Google's website that lists all of this information in a lot more detail but it is targeted towards more consumers like they'll be talking about hey this great new feature of conversation bubbles uh, you're probably not going to be using conversation bubbles as much in enterprise I don't think our workforce connect tool uh, supports them but you know it's, it's, it's different use cases uh, but there are some overlap things like privacy and, privacy and security content capture I've got a couple of slides on that coming later on uh, but the single feature that we're getting the most questions about in Android 11, and we saw a lot of uh, questions on this in Android 10, was the move towards scope storage. So this is a Google mandated change that all Android OEMs need to implement scope storage, and then all developers need to adhere to the scope storage development paradigm. That's a bit of a uh, and the, the, what it is, just so everyone's on the same page, first introduced in Android 10, it was a change in behavior of how an application handles mass storage and the best well, external storage, you know, two words for the same, for the same concept there. Um, the way I sort of explain it, how I find works best is previously, as long as an application had been granted the appropriate permissions, so they were runtime permissions from Marshmallow onwards, uh, write external storage and read external storage, then the application had access, uh, read and write access to the whole of what used to be the SD card back in Jelly Bean and KitKat and Gingerbread, and, and so sort of now it's just sort of generic flash-based uh, mass storage, but it's external storage. Um, now there is, uh, with scope storage, an application does not have that unfettered access to external storage. They only have access to a specific slice of external storage, which uh, which they cannot share with another application unless they take specific steps to do so. And this really has an impact on use cases uh, such as, um, like a common one, for example, is many applications would be configured with a config XML file, and you would download that to the root of the SD card, and then the applicant with an EMM or file transfer or something, and then your application would, you know, always look in that location on the SD card and say, "Oh, I've got a new config file," and they would load it in, and yes, you know, it, it worked. It was very simple uh, and robust, but uh, it was very prone to security attacks you know you you could conceive of uh, a nefarious application intercepting that configuration so now they know your config or uh, maybe maybe uh, you know, less friendly they could modify the config before it actually gets to the application so those kind of security loopholes are being closed with scope storage but all of that I, I think will probably be familiar to most of this audience what uh, most people are more interested in is what can I do about it as an application developer? And what we are, well, the recommendation in Android 10 was to use this request legacy external storage flag. And to a man or lady developer, everyone pretty much did that. I, I don't know of any specific uh, <laughs> you know, customer that actually went ahead and implemented scope storage in the Android 10 timeline. Um, this flag, uh, just if you set it, then your application would work just as though scope storage wasn't a thing. You know, it was essentially a way of kicking the can down the road. Well, unfortunately, the can can be kicked no further. Uh, the flag will not work in Android 11, and therefore it is necessary to make some change to uh, your application, or you know, we'll, we'll get into what some of the options are. Um, so what can you do? in Android 11. Uh, so Zebra, just to be clear, are not offering a direct alternative to scope storage. We don't have like, we don't have a flag request Zebra external storage equals true uh, that you can just set. So uh, there, there will need to be some work and considerations uh, that need to be made. Um, we have a new feature, which I looked at the documentation and it's not yet on the public doc. So I won't go into this too much, but it will be documented more fully over the coming days, if not weeks or months, which is a feature called Secure Storage Manager. And this is a Zebra proprietary feature. And what this allows an application to do is to share uh, key value pairs. So if you're sharing strings uh, with a specific other named application. So this uh, use case of sharing from one application to the other 
can be achieved with scope storage uh, sorry with secure storage manager and you're also able to persist that information across an enterprise reset as well so if those cover your use cases then please do uh, please do check that out um, the other the, th the third bullet uh, that a lot of customers are considering is the use of managed external storage and you can go down a little bit of a rabbit hole understanding managed external storage it is a permission which you can request in your manifest and the application once it's requested this permission can be granted external storage permission by the user uh, and once it has that external storage permission, it essentially works just like any other application that before scope storage was a thing. So it's another way of bypassing scope storage. So it's conceivably quite a powerful tool. Um, understand though, that uh, authorization step by the user. So the application can request external, manage external storage. The user has to allow it uh, on consumer devices that actually involves going out into the settings screen, which is always a bit frightening for some users. We have an MX feature accessible through Stage Now or OEM config that allows uh, you to essentially allow <laughs> managed external storage without the user having to worry about going into the settings. So that, that, that's a winner. The, the downside is though, any application which is being published to the Play Store uh, needs to comply with some additional restrictions that the Play Store puts in place. And uh, like it, essentially your application needs to adhere to a predefined set of use cases in order to use managed external storage. Um, that does not apply for private app distribution. If you're just distributing an application privately within, you know, to a specific organization, uh, things do get a little bit gray area if you're deploying to multiple organizations. I don't have any more slides on scope storage because otherwise I'd, I'd talk. In fact, I'm giving a dedicated talk on scope storage at the upcoming DevCon. So if you want to understand more about how you would configure a Zebra applications such as enterprise browser, data wedge, uh, enterprise keyboard uh, through you know file what's it called content file providers uh, then you know come please come to the devcon and we'll go over that in more detail. Um, but for now uh, please do check out the developer portal developer.zebra.com I recently as in yesterday I think it was or two days ago published a blog uh, that lists all of the scope storage options that are available to you as a developer uh, some and, and sort of the explanations of why you might or might not want to consider them so uh, yeah hopefully yeah, check the blog or come to the subsequent presentations for more information on scope storage um, but I'm going to move on move move topics now and I want to talk about package visibility and the effect on Zebra features. So package visibility was a change. I always, I always explain this rather poorly. It, it was a change which Android, Google, Android made uh, to the platform to, uh, and what they're trying to do here is to prevent an application from knowing about other applications on the device. It's all about locking down privacy, security concerns of Android as a whole. And we want to live within those uh, those sort of security uh, lockdowns. You know, we, we don't want to do anything to bypass anything that's, that's um, determined to be like privacy. Uh, anyway, I, 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 I divest, digest. Uh, uh, so these APIs will now return reduced results. You're only able to essentially find out about yourself. You can't see what other applications are available on the device. Um, most applications won't really be affected by this in enterprise so I kind of skipped over it first of all when I was writing what's new in, in Android 11 for I was do a, a blog post um, but be aware though that you need to change your application uh, if you're using the EMDK for Android or for Xamarin if you're using OEM info so that's the uh, tool that allows you to get the serial number Bluetooth MAC address IMI number on separate devices running Android 10 or higher and also if you plan on using that new secure storage manager I mentioned earlier on you will need to specify the package in your Android manifest so uh, this is obviously in documentation um, but yeah, if you, OEM info, you need to use that package name, EMTK, that package name. You can obviously use more than one package in the same application. I have a couple of demo apps out there that already do that. Uh, but yeah, this is, um, so it will be available in the docs for that 
just be aware of that. That's been a very common uh, error that, that's that's come out of the uh, some of our beta testers, as well as um, what was my other point? I forget. Oh, this this only applies if you specify the target API as thirty. Uh, some, sometimes this causes confusion. Just understand that even though you update the target API to 30, you can still specify a different minimum SDK. So I could have an application which targets API 30 and in theory supports all the way back to, I think it's API level 14 with the latest support libraries, but there's, there's ways of going all the way back to Android uh, gingerbread if you're still running our old ET1s. So in fact, I think they got a jelly bean update in the end. Uh, okay, new topic. Uh, permission changes. So there have been some changes to permissions that uh, have been made by Google overall. And I'm going to go over some of these just, uh, I'm not going to dive too deeply because the real takeaway that I want you to take away from all of these permission changes is that if you're using an EMM or you're installing your applications through Stage Now, uh, any mechanism that pre-grants runtime permissions these changes won't affect you. I mean, it's it's good to know, but uh, yeah, let, let's just go in to, to talk about what they are because you may well need to implement runtime permissions if your application is not being deployed by EMM or you have to handle you know, all sorts of scenarios. Anyway, let's just go over these quickly. I think the best way I found of showing these changes is through a sort of right hand and, and left hand picture comparison. So what you're seeing here is a demonstration of the one-time permissions change. And this is a change that Android made where the user now has the option to only grant your application the runtime permission you're asking for a single time. And what what's happened here is what was previously allow in Android 10, so Android 10 is on the left, Android 11 is on the right, uh, allow would allow that camera permission in this case now and forever. Uh, with Android 11, the allow option has been split into two. So while using the app is that one-time permission. Sorry, while while using the app is forever, and only this time is the is the one-time permission just just granted this time. Uh, so the obvious question now is, well, if allow has been turned into two options, and like we have we have three options and we have three options. So what's happened with deny and don't ask again and, and deny? What's happened there? Well, uh, what has happened there is the the two options have been merged into one. So what was previously deny is deny. Uh, it's one of those words where if you say it too many times, it loses all meaning. Um, deny and don't ask again has been removed. And what actually happens is after I'm, I'm having to read the slides, I always forget the number. After the second the second the time that user presses deny, then the Android is always going to return deny to the application. It's, it's just assuming that the user will always want to deny the, the camera permission, in this case, to the application. Um, and then permissions auto reset. Uh, actually, let me just do these slides in a different order and explain what this is. So I, well, it's not just me, everyone who runs Android 11 and higher, might at some point receive on their, I mean, this is on my personal phone, but this is a feature of, of Android 11. Uh, you get this kind of notification that says some permissions have been removed from unused applications. And you think, well, thank you. What have you removed? And you can actually click into that. And then you see the, the second image here. And it's telling me in in this, uh, in this, this is like a, a setting screen. Uh, I've removed permission from the Marriott application. This is my personal phone. Uh, obviously, we had COVID, so I didn't use the Marriott uh, app for a while. Uh, where was me? Uh, and then if you click on the, the trash can garbage icon, whatever it's called in your native tongue, uh, then you get the option to uninstall the application. But the permissions have already been removed at this point. And obviously, removing the location permission for the Marriott app on my phone is you know big deal. Uh, removing permissions automatically in enterprise is a bigger deal, arguably. Uh, but understand, and I, I did some testing, I didn't see this uh, documented anywhere, actually. Um, it might be now, but when I was putting this together, it wasn't. Anyway, uh, here, what I'm doing is I have a test application, which I have like uploaded to the Play Store. It's a, a simple location logging application. It has a location permission. And uh, it uh, on the left, this application has been delivered to a device and has had 
runtime permissions automatically granted. Uh, so I think I was using like the Android management experience for this, but it's extending to any EMM or even test DPC, I guess. If you're pre-granting those, those permissions, then uh, you'll see it on the left. Now, notice, compare that with the application that was installed, just how you would install a standard application through ADB or through the, the Play Store without an EMM. The, the option to remove permissions is not available. In fact, uh, don't be, this is an awful screenshot because that, so that option should be ticked. Uh, the remove permissions if app isn't used should be ticked. It's just because it, the app itself was compiled with an older API level that it's showing as, as unticked. But my point here is you will not be subject to permissions auto reset if you have deployed your application in such a way that runtime permissions are pre-granted. It's a very long, long winded way of saying that. So uh, yeah, like I said at the beginning of all this, the takeaway is if you're pre-granting runtime permissions, none of all that should affect you, but I think it is important to understand. Um, and related to that, and um, and one reason why, in fact, we'll, we'll get, uh, let, let me get on to, to that point actually. So uh, related to permission changes, and I promise this is the last section on permission changes, is foreground and background permission in Android 11 has undergone another change. So there was a change in Android 10, if you remember, those following along at home. Uh, Android 10 introduced uh, a new permission. They separated out the foreground and the background permissions. Uh, now, in this change to uh, Android 11, the, the new rule is that you cannot request the foreground and the background permission in the same location request. So when you're requesting your runtime permissions, normally you pass in an array of the permissions you're asking for and you, you get back like whether they were granted or, or not. You can't do foreground and background location requests at the same time if you're targeting API level 30. Um, if you're targeting API level 29, you can still request them at the same time. I hope I'm getting this right because I'm not reading the slide, but if, if, if I'm getting it wrong, no, I'm, I'm sure it's right. Uh, it, it, you can request them at the same time, but the dialogue changes. And I've got many, many images on the subsequent slides. So I'll go over those uh, briefly, shortly. Um, the, the other change that's worth noting, that's not strictly part of Android 11, is there's some uh, Play Store restrictions on background location permission access. Uh, the, the place, if you're going to upload your application to the Play Store, and that includes the managed Play Store, not necessarily the private application distribution, but the managed Play Store, uh, then you need to adhere to the Play Store policy for background location in your apps. And I've got like a link to the, the, the details there, or you can you know, Google it, it's not, not hard to find. Uh, and it's a bit of an involved process. Uh, you need to you need to like show how the runtime permissions are presented in your application and uh, like in the workflow, the, the expectation, it's really a consumer focused process to be honest with you. The expectation is that you would guide the user through the process of, oh, now I need to track your location because I'm doing something which meets your use case and therefore, hey, give me background permission and you, you launch the request at that point. Um, all very consumery, uh, but like obviously in enterprise, like we just said before, you're probably going to be pre-granting those permissions. So how do you comply with this process and still adhere to like your, your normal distribution method where you're pre-approving uh, them? I went out onto the, the forums as we all do, uh, and there's like a, an OEM uh, like. EMM developers forum, which which I'm a member of, and I sort of asked on there, like, what what are you guys doing? What challenges have you had with this? And like the responses I got back was, uh, you need to implement the runtime permission model like a consumer app would do. You, know, you have to follow the Play Store process uh, so that you can get posted into the Play Store. But then once you're posted, you can obviously pre-grant those permissions and everything would just work hunky dory. But th that's another that's kind of the reason why I wanted to explain those those permission dialogues in the previous slides because it is important to know if if anything else to adhere to this uh, background location process but uh, let me uh let me just show you what some of these or some of these uh differences look like and i promise there's only a couple of slides on here so this is the same device it's always running android 10 in this instance but what i'm doing i'm changing the target sdk in the in the first two images there so target sdk 26 which I think is Oreo, uh, 
access fine location. So remember in Android Oreo, location is foreground and background. Therefore, the dialogue is saying all the time or only while using the app, background or foreground um, uh, and both. Uh, whereas in Android 10, SDK level 29, was Android 10. When I request access find location, the assumption is I'm only going to use that in the foreground. Therefore, uh, the the dialogue reflects that. And then in fact, I'm getting lots of buzzes. Let me just double check. No one's telling me, hey, you're talking nonsense. Nope. Okay, that was something else. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, whereas in the third image here, uh, I've requested both the foreground and background location. And notice how now I'm back to the same dialogue I had back on Oreo, where I was just uh, requesting um, location in the uh, in yeah the, the the we only had the location option back then all those years ago uh in android 11 uh this is on the left here it's the difference it's in fact you see the same thing sdk target of android 10 or sdk target of android 11 running on an android 11 device accessing fine location will always show the same dialogue uh while using the app only this time. That's that one time permission dialogue, but it's always going to apply to location when the app is in the foreground. The uh, case where you are targeting Android 10 and you're requesting both foreground and background at the same time, remember that's not allowed in, in Android 11. If you target SDK 30, that's the, the right hand uh, option there. It's, it's no dialogue is shown, it's just d disallowed immediately. Uh, whereas uh, in Android, 11, if you're targeting Android 10, you'll see that option of, hey, the, the developer expected, blah, 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 blah. Um, I, I did some tests. And for me, if I was pre-granting the location permission, uh, do, I have a, do I have one of those fancy laser pointer things? Laser pointer, there you go. This, if I was pre-granting my permissions, this worked. Uh, the locations were automatically granted. They were not they were not uh, disallowed immediately. Um, I didn't see that documented anywhere, so I wouldn't recommend that, you know, to just make that assumption. Uh, I would recommend changing your application to request the foreground and background separately and then still pre-granting them, but just be aware you might be able to get away with not making any changes here. Uh, hopefully that was all clear. So I did have a, a conclusion page here. I think I've covered everything here in my conclusion. Yep, yep, nothing else to say here. And then I promise one more slide on permissions. These aren't strictly runtime permissions, so please give me this one. A couple of changes. Google will, uh, please don't make me go into the low level detail of exactly what has changed here, but Google has made some changes to the behavior of the system alert window and also package usage stats. Uh, system alert window is uh, how you display, I always remember it is you display that whole, that little bubble icon, that's how the old Facebook chat heads used to work, or uh, more, more relevant for enterprise, data capture plus, that's how we used to implement that. Uh, package usage stats gives you more information about an application's network access. Uh, very useful if you want to monitor the outgoing and incoming network traffic in a realistic scenario that you might be running. I've got like test, a test app out there and a blog on that a little while ago now, but uh, yeah. Um, my point though is uh, even though Google will say you need to have the user go into the settings screen and approve your app to have these permissions, we do have a feature of MX available through Stage Now or OEM Config by your EMM. Uh, and because it's not a runtime permission, it's not like, with all the rest of the runtime permission logic, it's it's in the access manager. And so we have like a permission feature, system alert window, package usage stats. There's a couple of others in there, including manage external storage, and you can automatically grant your application to have these rather than rely on the end user to go into the settings, which obviously you're not going to want to do if you're setting up any number of remote devices, frankly, tens, hundreds, thousands, whatever. Uh, so then some changes to the foreground service. This is another area that uh, Android updated back in Android 10. They introduced the concept of foreground services and they said, if you're going to access the location in a foreground service and therefore be considered in the foreground when you're accessing that location, then you need to define the type of the foreground service to be location type. In Android 11, there's two new types that have been added. If your application needs access to the camera, it needs the camera type. If your application needs access to the microphone, give it the microphone type. And uh, yeah, so 
what that does, uh, you, I kind of thought, why is, why is Android doing this? And maybe it's obvious to everyone else. But uh, after some digging, I, I, I think the reason is it's so Android can apply more rules to uh, the restrictions that it needs to, to impose upon your application. So the example I've got here is that foreground service launched from a background app cannot use camera or microphone. Well, how does Android know that you're using the camera or microphone? Uh, well, I guess it could look at what APIs you're using. I, I don't know. That's my theory of, of why these types exist. I'm sure there's a, an actual explanation online um, since I put these slides together. But uh, yeah, foreground service, just bear that in mind. You'll need to add new types in. It's just a code change. Uh, if you're running running on Android 11, if you're targeting, yeah, if you're, hmm, I need to check that. Uh, okay, weight clocks and battery swap. Uh, this is a, a feature which I haven't actually spoken about before, uh, even internally actually, but just be aware, it, we have a, a feature in Zebra devices called battery swap. Uh, if you press and hold the power button, and I won't try and show this on camera because I know my, my webcam's awful, but you actually get a little icon down here that says battery swap. And if I click that, I I get like being told how to use battery swap, but essentially I can put my device into a, not a low power state, but it, it saves the device's state to memory, like, like standby, you know, in, in the old PCs. Uh, and then I can swap the battery out and I can insert a fresh battery. And obviously, because I didn't put this device into battery swap mode, it's turned off, but if I had have put it into battery swap mode, then it, I could have just continued performing my, my job. Uh, th this isn't a new feature by any means. It's been in the product for quite some time in, in our devices. But what has changed is we could previously clear all the wake clocks in Android 10 and earlier. Uh, if your device is Android, running Android 11, just bear in mind if any application uh, that you have uh, is maintaining a partial wake clock, uh, then you can uh, not put the device into a battery swap mode. You'll need to make sure that those wake clocks get cleared. Uh, if you're having trouble with this, then I can't remember the command off the top of my head, but it's like dump sys something or other, and you can you can search at what applications have wake clocks. It's obviously it's, um, Google, uh, <laughs> the information's on the internet out there, but yeah, that's how I would go about solving if I was having this kind of issue. But yeah, just bear that in mind. If you update to Android 11, suddenly your battery swap feature isn't working. This is most likely the root cause. Um, some of the other features which are worth mentioning, there is a new screen recording option in Android 11 out of the box. So very common use case in enterprise, something's gone wrong, you need to no, obviously not with our devices though, but maybe it's our competitor devices. Uh, yeah, you want to record the screen for some reason to, to show someone what's going on. Uh, you no longer have to install some third party screen recording application. You can use the, the inherent feature of Android. Just bear in mind it is hidden in the quick settings settings quick settings options. You need to like swipe down from the top with two fingers or swipe down twice and then go uh, into that little pencil icon. Then you need to find screen record and drag it up to your uh, to your capabilities and then you can exit the pencil icon. But once you have it, the experience is um, like I'm showing in the, in the icons here. And you can choose to record audio or, or show touches on screen, however you want to configure that. Uh, yeah, much better than downloading applications which are riddled with ads in my experience and uh, not not really uh, the best to use but um yeah it's not not the easiest of provisioning experiences there is it uh i do notice that we are discussing internally the ability to modify some of these quick settings tiles like the the possibility of that is certainly not something we're committing to it's just something we're discussing internally so uh, hopefully in the future this will be something that's a lot easier to to use for um for yourselves. Um, and then wireless debugging is another new feature which Android touted, Android 11 touted as a, a great new feature. And if you're anything like me, you would have seen that and thought, well, hang on a minute, I'm sure I used to do wireless debugging back in the day. Uh, the, the, the real change though, uh, once I dug into this and understood it a bit more, is you don't need to connect the device over USB. Uh, how wireless debugging used to work is, uh, please don't ask me to list the steps, but you, you'd at one point have to connect your phone or your Android device, uh, your Zebra Android device, to 
a um, to, to, to USB and then enable something and then you could connect over wirelessly, wireless USB. Uh, you can you can imagine a scenario now though, now that you don't have to connect first, uh, some of our devices have proprietary, not, well, I suppose it is proprietary connector, yeah, it's a Pogo-based connector. Uh, maybe you have a developer that has a device, but it, they don't have a, well, I can't show you my cradle cup, because there's a cradle cup here. Uh, conceivably, they could uh, you know, connect over, over wireless debugging and you know at least until you can ship them hardware and things become a bit easier i do have a, a little video uh, that shows what the experience of that is like oh, it, it is showing um there is a, a few steps to do but once you get used to the steps i think it becomes easier you can generate a pairing code you have to uh, enable debug options on your device obviously and then when you've got this pairing code it's on the same wi-fi network as the machine that you're pairing it with you can do an adb pair enter the pairing code and then just bear in mind that the next step is to connect to the device on a different port so now you're oh, oh i've still got my little laser pointer you're looking at this port up here 40562 this one here and then it connects now obviously I'm showing this on visor so it's kind of it's not really a fair test but you can imagine I didn't even need to have connected it over USB it, it would have just worked uh, I think this is gonna, if this is going to work quickly I'll let it play out but if it's going to take more than a couple of seconds I'll end the, the video early um, oh I think I think I skipped a little bit in my editing there there we go so now you see I press test permissions and the breakpoint is hit so there you go remote debugging uh, over over like wireless um very very useful i feel a new feature out of the box from from google that'll just work on any android 11 device the other uh this isn't a new feature this is a change uh that google have made to the toast api and this caused a lot of concern consternation when people first skim read it and you see toast api is being deprecated and oh no, I use Toast API. Well, everyone uses Toast API. Uh, Google would have to re really want to make some enemies if they deprecated the Toast API. Uh, it's not going away. Just understand what is going away is the custom Toast. So that, I didn't even know this thing existed, but there is the ability, or there was the ability, to define a custom layout for your Toast. And that's what you're seeing in the center image of, uh, an, uh, of an application there. Uh, so the custom toast is going away, replaced with the snack bar. So you still have two options. If you need quick and easy feedback to your developer, you can either use the uh, the, the left-hand side toast or the right-hand side toast. I wouldn't necessarily recommend to use them in production, although there are obviously cases and, and times when you would just use, use the toast because it's easier. Uh, and then uh, the final, in terms of features and changes, is uh, app compatibility. And I won't say too much about this because you can get really into the weeds on this, but I've been giving this kind of presentation for, for a little while now, for a few years. And I'm always talking about what's changed in Android because things are not easy to keep track of. Uh, like, and these changes are cumulative. So if you're going from Android 8 to Android 11, which I expect a lot of our customers will be, uh, you need to understand all of the changes in Android Pi, 10, and 11. There's quite a bit there. And so Google have kind of recognized this as something that's not easy to keep track of or not easy to make all of the updates at the same time. And therefore, uh, there's this new feature in uh, under the USB debugging settings. It's sort of hidden under the developer options. That's what I'm trying to say. And although you'll see a lot of options here, these are only the options of things that have changed going from Android 11 to Android 10. And some of the names can be a bit cryptic. Uh, I did notice that they're all documented well in, well, I haven't got the link here, but you know, it's, it's documented somewhere. What exactly remove Android, where's my, where's my laser point here? Remove, what exactly remove Android test base does? I, I'm not sure. Uh, I do know what the uh, camera microphone compatibility change ID is. That's the changes to the foreground services that I mentioned earlier on, that you need to specify the foreground service uh, type. And you might 
be making your updates to your application in stages. You might uh, do scope storage one week and then everything else another week. You don't want to, your application to be subject to all of those Android 11 changes. Well, that's when these compatibility options would be useful because you could disable, um, I, I don't know why they're all disabled here. I, I think it's just a strange way that the, uh, the um, app was configured when I took this uh, screenshot, but you could in theory disable the change of camera microphone compatibility, then you wouldn't have to worry about those foreground service changes. So probably not useful for everybody, but for developers, just be aware it's there. You might, you know, it's always good to have it in your in your back pocket as a, as a tool to, to address if you're making an upgrade. And then uh, just a few more slides. Uh, as we say every single year, uh, and it's always important to understand because more and more of our customers are moving to the Play Store. It, it's where Google are pushing customers towards because you're going to be using an EMM or not 95 percent of people will be using an EMM maybe not that high anyway uh, if you're using an EMM you're being pushed towards the device owner model device owner model requires use of the managed play store and if you want your application to be available to more than a few uh, organizations then you need to add your application to the the play store and then like whitelist it in the managed play store Anyway, all of that is to say more and more of our customers are using the Play Store uh, and just bear in mind that the required API level, this is the target API level, minimum API is unaffected, like I said earlier, but the target API level, you have to specify a recent level. So on the 2nd of August 2021, which is past now, all new applications needed to be targeting API level 30. So you already needed to be compliant with everything that I've said uh, in, in the previous, uh, whatever, how, 40 minutes or so. Uh, from the 1st of November, target API 11 for updates to applications. So these changes happen annually. Uh, in fact, I got, a, I got a, a tweet from someone at Google when I tweeted to say, hey, it's changed again. They, they sort of said, yes, it's going to change every year. Um, it's just how things work now. So just be aware that Android 12, I would put money on the fact that in early August 2022, you're going to need to target API level 31, I think they're at for S. Um, latest, AP, latest SDK level requirements. If you want more information, there's a lot more than what I've said today at that link follow. That's like a link to Google's documentation. The other thing to be aware of is the change to Android application bundles from APKs. Uh, and I've got a whole separate blog about this. Uh, you can go to the developer.zebra.com and search for uh, application bundles. And it, it should be the first result. If it's not, there's something wrong with the search algorithm. And uh, yeah, you just you have to submit as an AAB. It means uh, you need to sign the AAB with your own signing key, but then by and large, Google's going to take care of the signing process for you once after you've uploaded it. I, I won't go into the, to the details here, but just be aware that you need to submit your application as an AAB to the Play Store. Again, doesn't apply if you are distributing a private app or if you're distributing through uh, StageNow, for example. Uh, and then restrictions on non-SDK interfaces. So as we say, well, as I say every year, sorry, uh, the the initiative here has been going on for a little while now. It's to remove APIs which developers are calling, which Google don't really want them to call. Uh, they will be uh, hidden APIs. Maybe they'll be calling the API via reflection if they're using Java or Kotlin, uh, or in the NDK, it will be an undocumented API, which the developer just happened to find by reading the header file or something. It's been a while since I coded in C, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, every every uh, iteration of Android, the lists of what are allowed to be called, so public APIs, formerly known as the whitelist APIs, and then what are more gray areas, so APIs that are being deprecated, but Google still allow you to call them. And then finally, the disallowed list, the blacklist, uh, will raise an error, I think. Um, I, I have an article on the portal about this. Google have some really detailed documentation about these non-SDK interfaces. Uh, this screenshot was taken a little while back. I think I was running their offline analysis, static analysis tool on the Facebook app, APK, I want to say, that I downloaded from APK Mirror, maybe. Anyway, but there's, there's quite a few APIs in there, which uh, which were Facebook needed to update. But in conclusion, 
The major change is around scope storage and permission changes. Uh, for scope storage, uh, like it's most likely going to require a code change on your part, uh, on the developer's part, to comply with Google restrictions. Uh, we are doing what we can to make that easier for you. Like I say, there's there's an upcoming feature. Be uh, be aware of that in in the very soon uh, called Secure Storage Manager. Uh, I have a blog out there on some of the options available to you uh, and I'm also doing this presentation in, not this uh, a, an individual presentation on scope storage in DevCon runtime permissions probably won't affect you if you are pre-approving the application but just be aware that they exist and they are changing and then the only other features which if you sort of read through Google's changes that they've made to in fact I think that terminology I think they've got rid of the cope and the BYID terminology I think it's now called work managed work profile and personally oh, I, I don't know i'm sorry i don't know the terminology anymore but uh, yeah essentially what used to be cope and boad not necessarily for uh dedicated devices like uh like like zebra devices are um be aware though that we are always exploring the options of uh, enabling those kind of cope use cases the cons consumer Corporate owned, personally enabled, you know, might be a, a feature we, we enable in the future. We're investigating that. Uh, so all in all, I've got some resources at the end. Oh, I didn't mention everything I've said here is also available at this link here, recently published. Uh, it's not a blog. It's actually part of our tech docs, uh, but I wrote it and like when you when you add something to tech docs, it gets copy edited and made really nice and pretty. So yeah, that's available. Um, that's my blog there and uh, with that I think I'm okay to go to questions so let me see what I can find. okay uh, we've got a whole bunch Darren um, hang on let me open this up first of all can I just preface this by letting everybody know that this session is being recorded um, and at a later date it'll be added to our YouTube developer dev talk playlist so you can look for it there um, and then Darren I don't know if you're gonna have slides from this presentation to share but we can post it on the blog where we notified everyone on the portal of this yep. talk okay yep. great so um that's a confirmation on a couple of inquiries that came in and then i have a few questions so let's see what we've got here um regarding package visibility will an app require changes if it uses the data wedge intent api no it will not just checking i wasn't on mute sorry uh yeah you can use the data wedge intent api without issue uh the only the only like it's not really an edge case but if you're using the secure intent mechanism of data wedge the the way you do that is you actually have to call out to the uh to the access manager using the emdk and if you are therefore making use of data wedge secure intents which i don't think is that many people then you would need to um, add the package visibility for emdk but by and large the answer is no stacy Okay. Um, Bose asks, is there a workaround for the A10 limitation of getting current SSID? SSID? Uh, no. So okay. uh, yeah, that's that's one of the device identifiers, isn't it? So the only device identifiers we expose through our OEM info is uh, well, initially it was the Android device serial number and then it was the IMI IMEI number. We recently also extended that to the Bluetooth MAC address, but we are obviously open to features, uh, to adding new features, sorry. So if that's a feature request, then raise that with your Zebra representative and it will work its way into the into the backlog to get addressed. Okay, and um, does installing with Stage now have the same effect on permissions as installing from an E? MM. Yes. So uh, ever since Marshmallow, if you install your app through StageNow, it will pre-grant your runtime permissions for you. Uh, j just be aware, though, that if if I was like doing this in a production environment, just because I've pre-allowed the runtime permissions, it doesn't stop the user from going into the settings and removing them uh, at their free will. So you also need to then lock down the, uh, the settings screen and whatever else you need to do. There's like blogs and articles on, on that. But it, it, in answer to your question, yes, they are pre-approved if you install through stage now. Okay. Um, let's see here. 
Does the link to your blog say how StageNow can supply an application configuration file or put configuration values into SSM? No, um, because that's not been publicly published yet. I've seen like internal documents explaining that, uh, but no, it's, it's not yet public, but we are working on that. And that is something that I'll cover at the, uh, I'm looking over there because that's where my calendar is, at uh, the upcoming DevCon on like the 3rd of November. So hopefully we'll have a lot more public. And it, I mean, it's, it's not like a secret, but obviously we don't want to release something and then it changes and then we have to support the old thing, et cetera, et cetera. So we just want to make sure that it's, it's uh, solid before we release it. Okay, this is another A10 limitation question. It's, I think it's expanding on that. Is there a workaround for the A10 limitation of getting current connected Wi-Fi SSID? No, uh, okay. no, there's not. Uh, same, same answer as as last time. I think that might be the the same question actually, Stacey. But the there, there's question. all sorts of device identifiers with the same similar names. That might have been different. Right. It was just kind of a different way to ask. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, it doesn't appear we have any more questions right now. So if anyone does have a question that comes up as a result of reviewing this or maybe seeing the recording, you can email us at developer at zebra.com and I can pass this on to Darren or anyone else on the team that can answer your question. So knowing that we're gonna have updates that are gonna happen with DevCon and Darren shared he's doing quite a few um, talks and so don't forget to register. You'll start seeing that activity and that availability sometime next week. Um, and certainly you can always go to our dev portal to find out the information there as well. Um, Bo expanded on his questions and said, SSID is not a device identifier. It's the Wi-Fi name slash ID. Does that make any sense? Oh, the, the, the Wi-Fi, yeah, well, it, yeah, okay. I think Google would classify it as a device identifier. I mean, regardless of what it's called, it, if it was disallowed under Android 10, I still think we're talking about the same thing. And okay. yeah, that would that would be something which we could expose in OEM info. Uh, we haven't done that, but we could do it. So if it was a, a feature request, then please raise that. Okay. With the team. okay. Okay, great. Um, or or if we've misunderstood that, yeah. then please email. Yeah, sorry, Stacey. Yeah, again, please, if there's any confusion or we need to clarify anything or you want to share any more information or questions as a result, please always email us at developer at zebra.com and get ready for DevCon because we'll have more information um, there as well. And you'll get to see Darren again on All screen. All three times. All three times. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much for your attendance. We really appreciate it. You have an awesome day. Thank you. I'll see you next year for Android 12, new features and uh, updates. There we go. All right. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. Bye.